Today we're going to begin our discussion of utilitarianism, and this is an 18th century ethical theory or tradition. And it is one of the ethical traditions which really got a foothold in the history. And there are utilitarians even today. Okay. Now, before we talk about how utilitarian thought originates, as it does in the work of David Hume, although Hume himself, I would hesitantly call a utilitarian proper. The basic premise, that is, the utilitarian understanding of goodness is happiness. The good life is the happy life. Yes. Just yawning? Yeah. Okay. But unlike the way that Aristotle understood happiness as an enduring sense of well-being and ability to flourish under any circumstance, the utilitarians, taking their lead from Jeremy Bentham, maintain that happiness means pleasure and the absence of pain. Okay? Pleasure in the absence of pain. And so utilitarianism is what we might call a consequentialist theory of ethics. Because all that matters are the consequences of my action. Consequentialist theories deal in right and wrong actions which are judged according to their outcome. While non-consequentialist theories of ethics focus more on good or bad character, on the intention behind somebody's action. Because, of course, we realize that I can have the best of intentions and still a bad outcome arises. While I may have malevolent intel intentions and a good outcome arises. Okay? So both the consequentialist thinkers and the non-consequentialist thinkers, of course, have something legitimate to say about what it means to be good. I would say that virtue ethics and natural law ethics lean more toward the non-consequentialist type of theory. Because in virtue ethics, we're talking about becoming a certain kind of person. And it's entirely possible that I act virtuously and yet still do not flourish under some circumstance because of intervening factors over which I had no control. Natural law ethics also. I can seek to promote the fundamental goods indicated by the natural inclinations of human beings and because of no fault of my own, an untoward consequence results, okay? But we thereby do not make the judgment that I am a bad person, <clears throat> okay? I still did what morality requires of me. While contract theory is a consequentialist theory. Why? Because goodness means the satisfaction of self-interest. And we achieve that satisfaction by participating in social contracts. However, remember that if I am no longer benefiting from participation in the contract, 
it is no longer reasonable for me to abide by its terms. So what matters for the contract theory are the consequences for me. Whether or not my self-interest is satisfied. Utilitarianism is also a consequentialist theory. But the big difference between utilitarianism, utilitarianism and contractarianism as consequentialist theories is that for the utilitarians, the relevant consequence is the outcome for everyone, not just the agent. Utilitarianism seeks goodness understood as pleasure in the absence of pain, happiness, for anyone affected by my action. Okay? So there is a shift here from a more egoistic theory of ethics such as we find in the contract theory, to a more global sort of consciousness in the utilitarian tradition. Okay? So let us begin with this conception of goodness, as we have in each tradition. Goodness means happiness, understood as pleasure and the absence of pain. Okay? Now, it's important that we understand something about how this theory originates. Because Bentham and Mill take their cue from the work of David Hume. Hume argues, contrary to most of the ethical tradition <clears throat> thus far, that it is not reason which ought to guide us when making moral decisions, but rather feelings, what he calls the passions. Now think back, whether you're talking about Socrates or Aristotle, Aquinas or Hobbes, it was always reason that was to be our guide in making moral decisions. Because if we allow ourselves to be guided by our feelings or emotions, we tend to get into trouble and suffer. Okay? But Hume makes the following argument. Reason is a purely descriptive faculty. In other words, reason tells us what is the case. Reason observes the world. It can make hypotheses about the principles that govern that world and thus tells us what is. However, it cannot tell us what ought to be the case. Our passion does that. Passion is a prescriptive faculty. Okay? Reason tells us what is the case. It describes the world. Passion, on the other hand, is a prescriptive faculty which tells us what ought to be the case. Now let me illustrate this to you. For example, you know your reason tells you that if you want to succeed on a quiz, that there are certain things you ought to do. 
You ought to attend class, study the lecture notes, do the reading, etc. But does simply knowing that motivate you to do it? It doesn't. You must have an interest in doing well on the quiz. Simply knowing how to do well on the quiz doesn't get you off the couch. Okay? You must first have a passion in virtue of doing well on the quiz. Once you have an interest, then we appeal to reason, which tells us how to achieve it. And so Hume teaches that reason is and ought always remain a slave to the passions. So really, this is a major reversal or repudiation of ethical tradition, which ranks reason above passion. Hume reverses this and prioritizes the passions over reason. Okay? And, for Hume, we possess a natural sentiment of feeling in favor of the happiness of others. So here is another major difference between utilitarianism and contractarianism. Remember, according to Hobbes, in the state of nature, we have no such natural feeling of benevolence toward others. We are completely self-interested. Can you repeat that again? You possess a natural... Yes. According to Hume, and unlike the contract theorists, we possess a natural sentiment in favor of the well-being of others. It makes us feel good when we see other people happy. Okay? Now, of course, I will leave it to you to assess that claim. Sometimes it does make me happy to see other people happy. But if I'm going to be completely honest with you, that has a lot to do with the mood that I'm already in. Okay? If I'm happy, it's great when other people are happy. But if I'm unhappy, the happiness of others can be aggravating. Okay? But Hume maintains nonetheless that we do possess a natural sentiment, a passion, in favor of the happiness of others. And happiness, remember, for the utilitarians, means pleasure and the absence of pain. Okay? And so we really begin with what has been called Hume's Law. Hume's Law states that one cannot derive an ought from an is, an ought statement from an is statement. In other words, I cannot simply describe the way the world is and deduce from that description the way the world ought to be. The only thing that can tell me how things ought to be are my passions, my feelings. Now, I know that I myself seek happiness. I desire pleasure and to avoid pain. And I can easily generalize those feelings to anyone else 
who is capable of pleasure and pain. Okay? So whether the feeling of benevolence is a priori, whether I'm born with it or whether I develop it by simply recognizing that I want pleasure and don't want pain and others are sufficiently like me and so they also seek pleasure in the absence of pain is really irrelevant, okay? I am aware that not only other people, but any kind of being which is capable of feeling is capable of experiencing pleasure and pain. So here is another major development in utilitarianism that breaks with the tradition. We are not just talking about human beings. If goodness means happiness, and happiness means pleasure in the absence of pain, and what makes it possible to experience pleasure in the absence of pain is what I'll call sentience. Okay. Sentience is the ability to feel, okay, to have a nervous system, nerve endings. The utilitarians seek to maximize happiness for all sentient beings. In other words, animals count too. And we haven't seen this before. Largely because ethics has remained a matter of reason, and reason, to our knowledge, is the sole property of human beings. Okay? at least so far as we can prove. But because utilitarianism <clears throat> takes its origin from feelings and not reason, then any being capable of feeling is a morally relevant being. Okay? You all with me? Yes, sir. That's the odd question. So would a utilitarian be a vegetarian or a vegan or whatever? Good question. All right. We need to step a little bit further in. The principle of utility, just like natural law ethics, has its principle of natural law or the principle of double effect. Utilitarianism has its basic principle, which is called the principle of utility, or alternatively, the greatest happiness principle. Okay? Now, according to classical utilitarianism, one ought to maximize the happiness of any being affected by my action. Okay? And according to Bentham, every sentient being counts for one, and nobody counts for more than one. In other words, my happiness, understood as pleasure in the absence of pain, is not more important than yours, and it's not more important than an animal's, just because it happens to be mine. And so, when determining what I ought to do, 
Utilitarianism comes down to a game of numbers. I am to seek the maximum possible happiness. Okay? And in order to calculate what action is going to bring about the most happiness, we employ what the utilitarians call a hedonic calculus. Okay. What does hedonic mean? Pertaining to pleasure, like the word hedonism. Okay? A hedon is one who seeks pleasure above all other concerns. Okay? So the hedonic calculus is a mathematics for calculating how much pleasure and pain is likely to be produced by my action. Okay? So when it comes to asking questions of the sort you just raised, like can a utilitarian eat meat or use animals for clothing or medical research, there is no cut and dry answer. It comes down to the calculations. All right? So let's just begin like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are eight of us in here, and each one of us counts equally. And let's say that I am considering some action which will affect all eight of us, but nobody else. Okay? Let's say that. Let's say that I am considering, which I'm not, but let's say that I was considering pushing the due date for the midterm up. Okay? Let's say I was going to make the midterm due tonight. But because I'm doing that, I'm going to automatically add 10 points to everybody's score. Okay? Now, some of you may be positively impacted by this. Those of you who have already done some studying for it and are ready to take it would probably be more than happy to take it tonight and get the extra 10 points. But others perhaps have not prepared for it at all and would be better served taking it later, even if it means sacrificing those extra 10 points. Okay? So what I have to do is make up some kind of scale of happiness. So let's imagine that a 10 is the greatest amount of pleasure that you can possibly experience. And a negative 10 is the greatest amount of pain you could possibly experience. Kind of like when you go to the doctor and they ask you to rate your pain on a scale of 1 to 10. Okay? So I go around the room and I ask you questions about whether you're prepared for the quiz, whether you want to take it, you know, whether you have any other plans for it this evening, and so forth. And I assign a number. How much pain or pleasure will my action cause you? Okay? Then... I simply take the total and divide it by the number of people. And if it turns out that my action will bring about a net increase in pleasure, if I end up on the positive side of zero, rather than the negative side of zero. 
then my action is permitted. Okay? But if doing so, assigning the quiz for tonight, uh, the midterm for tonight, is going to cause more pain on the whole than pleasure, then the action is prohibited. I can't do it. Okay? So let's take your question. And ask whether or not I ought to be a vegetarian. Well, I would have to take into consideration, first of all, how much pleasure does eating meat bring me? And that, of course, is not just going to mean the actual taste of the meat, but also the health that it can bring, okay? Versus not eating meat. And I also have to take into consideration how much pain is caused for the animal. Are they killed humanely? Are they raised in small pens where they can't move? Okay? I have to take into consideration perhaps a sizable number of factors in order to make the determination as to whether or not some action will increase happiness for everyone or decrease it. Now this might seem unfair. We might run into problems, especially <clears throat> violations of the Pauline principle. Because imagine a situation like this. Imagine that we are a community and one of our number has been murdered. Nobody knows who the murderer is, but we are all enraged. We are incensed because this was a well-respected and beloved member of our community. And the longer that we go without finding the culprit, the more angry we become. And in fact, we take to the streets. We become a lynch mob, okay? You can imagine us with our torches and our dogs and we're running through the streets looking for the culprit. And this has a chain reaction. And before you know it, there's looting going on and the toppling of cars, and the setting ablaze of businesses and homes, and the trampling underfoot of babies and elderly people, okay? And I realize that this cannot be allowed to continue. So how can I stop it? And I realize that even though I don't know who the murderer is, if I was to bear false witness against somebody, let's say that I am well-respected enough in our community where if I were to say, he did it, you all would believe me. And I realize that even though falsely blaming somebody for this murder is going to obviously be a violation of what I would ordinarily conceive of as justice, Perhaps we hang the poor innocent fellow and his family suffers as a result. By doing so, I put an end to the riot. I save lives. I save businesses. I save property. Okay? The question is, ought I to bear false witness against this poor guy? And if we are strict utilitarians, it seems like such an action might be permitted. Even though it conflicts with our common sense intuition about justice and rights, the problem is, if you are a utilitarian, the only relevant consideration is whether or not my action 
brings about a net increase in happiness. Only the numbers count. If I begin talking about principles of justice or individual human rights, I have introduced a foreign standard of goodness, and I'm no longer just a utilitarian. So what the utilitarian needs to do is find a way to incorporate a theory of justice and rights, but on utilitarian terms. Okay? I would have to show something like this, that if my calculations tell me that the right thing to do violates my common sense feeling about what is right, then I have failed to take something into consideration. For example, not only is the innocent party going to suffer and his family, but the real killer will remain on the loose and likely will kill again which is going to cause pain. When he does so, our community will discover that we have punished the wrong person, which will shake our confidence in the legal system, which will also bring about uneasiness and pain. Okay? Plus the guilt that we will feel for having possibly hanged an innocent person. Okay, so we must be very careful to take into consideration all the factors. And the utilitarian would have to say something like this. Again, if your calculation is prescribing actions which we just know are wrong, then we have failed to do the calculation correctly. Okay. Now another possible answer to the difficulty with violations of the Pauline principle, remember, what do I mean by this? If the only relevant consideration is how much happiness is produced for all sentient beings affected by my action, then it seems that the end of maximizing happiness does justify any means, which is precisely what the Pauline principle says we cannot do. Okay. Well, one traditional way of solving this problem is to interpret utilitarianism not as a doctrine about particular actions, but rather as a doctrine about a set of rules. And so we distinguish what we might call act utilitarianism from what we might call rule utilitarianism. Act utilitarianism is classical utilitarianism where everyone counts equally and we go through the process of calculating how much pain or pleasure will be caused by an action. Rule utilitarianism suggests that the calculations have really already been done for us over the entire course of human history. We know what sorts of actions are likely to bring about happiness and which ones are more likely to bring about pain. Okay? And so, if we adopt a set of rules, let's say something like the Ten Commandments, we don't steal, we don't lie, we don't kill, 
We don't harm innocent people. Okay? Rule utilitarianism suggests that if we simply follow this set of rules, then over the course of an entire lifetime, we will have produced a net increase in happiness. Okay? Now the problem with this is that there are clearly going to be cases where following the rule will bring about a great deal of pain. Let's say that one of the rules is telling the truth. Okay? And I am a Dutch fisherman who's using my ship to smuggle Jewish families out of Germany during the reign of the Nazis, okay? And a Nazi SS officer boards my ship and asks me, are you carrying anybody on board? Now, if I follow the rule and tell the truth, we're all dead. Our families will suffer and they will likely start searching every ship, and there will be more suffering. So it seems that in such a case, the right thing to do would be to tell a lie. And so what do we say? Do we say, all right, you ought to follow this set of rules unless by breaking one of the rules, you can bring about more happiness than by following it. Well, then we are right back into act utilitarianism, calculating every single action. So I'm not sure that rule utilitarianism is a viable answer to the problem of violations of the Pauline principle. In my estimation, the most promising tactic for the utilitarian in order to save the theory would be to demonstrate that if your calculations prescribe actions which conflict with our most basic common sense intuitions, about right and wrong, then something has gone wrong with the calculation. We have failed to take something into account. And so the utilitarian would have to say that if you get the calculation correctly, then you will never arrive at the prescription of an action that is wildly inconsistent with our basic sense of right and wrong. Okay? But I can't simply introduce a foreign standard of justice or human rights. I can't just say, okay, do whatever is going to bring about the most happiness for all of sentient creation, or at least any sentient being affected by my action unless the action violates this set of basic human rights. Because then I have to ask, where did that set of rights come from? I am employing a different standard, a non-utilitarian standard. Okay. So utilitarianism is a doctrine about maximizing happiness, where happiness is understood as pleasure in the absence of pain. Now, some have criticized utilitarianism on the basis of its being a doctrine of animality. That any moral theory which concerns itself with pleasure is a base sort of moral theory, okay? 
Well, the utilitarian in response, especially Mill, would say, in fact, it is you who is doing a disservice to humanity by assuming that the only kind of pleasure available to us is physical pleasure or animalistic pleasure. Okay? Human beings are capable of a wide array of pleasures, both physical and intellectual, emotional, psychological, okay? the pleasure of reading a book, of listening to music, of going to the theater, of having conversation. These are all intellectual pleasures, and they count just as much as the physical pleasures do. And if we are to be honest, even the so-called strictly physical pleasures for a human being are never strictly physical, right? You've all had the experience of eating something at a table with a tablecloth and ambient lighting and it actually seems to make the food taste better, okay? Sexuality is not just about bodies. It's about who you're with and knowing the person, okay? So even the physical pleasures, when it comes to a human being, are elevated by our intellectual awareness of what we're doing. And so, by pleasure, we mean all kinds of pleasure. And in fact, John Stuart Mill argues that if you were to survey the people who have sufficient experience of both the animalistic kinds of pleasure and the higher order pleasures, the pleasures with which involve the intellectual elements of our nature. None of them would sacrifice the intellectual pleasures even for a full share in the physical. Okay, what does that mean? Well, just ask yourself, okay? If you were going to be sent to a desert island to live out the rest of your days, and you knew that you were going to have plenty of food to sustain you, plenty of fruits and vegetables and, you know, even animals to hunt, But you can only have your favorite food. Let's say that your favorite food on earth is lobster or something, or ice cream. You can't have any of that unless you agree never to read another book or never to listen to another piece of music. I don't think anybody would sacrifice being able to listen to music or to read a book or to have conversation just so that they can have an endless supply of ice cream. Okay? And so for Mill, the intellectual or higher order pleasures for those people who have adequate experience of both kinds outrank the baser physical animalistic pleasures. Okay? But again, if you ask me personally, I think that we can't draw that distinction too sharply. Because even the physical pleasures for a human being 
are always enhanced by the intellectual element. Okay? We don't just eat, we dine. We don't just procreate. Okay? We make love. We don't just seek shelter from the elements. We decorate our homes so that we can dwell. Okay? All right. Let me just take a look at my notes and see if there's anything that I've overlooked. One thing that you must keep in mind is that according to Bentham, alongside the principle of utility, or the greatest happiness principle, which states that we ought to maximize happiness for all of sentient creation, is the principle of equality. That every sentient beings happiness counts the same your happiness shouldn't influence my decision making just because you happen to be my friend okay i've got to treat everyone equal in making my calculations okay I'd also like to say a word about Hume and his location of the moral order in the passions rather than reason. Hume points out to us, or at least suggests, that our word sentiment or feeling has the same Latin root sentire okay, as the word sentient. Okay. Sentire means something like to feel. Okay. And of course, our sentiments are our feelings about something. But this is also the root for our word sentient, which means the capacity to feel in the physical sense. And so Hume thinks that there is a very close connection between our ability to feel physically and our emotions or feelings. And if you think about it, your feelings do manifest themselves physically. When you're afraid, right, you get that feeling of butterflies, perhaps, in your stomach, or if you're startled or excited, your hair might stand up on end, okay? And so our ability to, f or, uh, to feel in the physical sense is very closely related to the way we feel about states of affairs, okay? Our feelings in general our passions, okay? And that's why for Hume and the subsequent utilitarians, Mill and Bentham, when we're talking about maximizing happiness, we must include any being that is capable of feeling. 
So again, back to your sort of question. If performing medical research on an animal, even painful research, that could possibly or even probably lead to a cure for a disease from which countless children suffer, okay? Then perhaps that is justified on a utilitarian standard. But inflicting pain on animals just so that I can have a longer lasting mascara is a different story, okay? But what makes the difference is how much pleasure is actually produced. I would say that the pleasure and absence of pain that is produced by curing a disease that kills children justifies or outranks some degree of suffering for the animal, whereas that same degree of suffering would not be justified when put in the service of something like cosmetics. Okay? But again, it comes down to the numbers, which is very difficult. Utilitarianism, in the classical sense, asks us to quantify pleasure and pain. Of course, the doctor asks us to do that too. You know, where is your pain on a scale of 1 to 10? But this does assume that I am able to know certain things about you, that I can actually calculate how much pleasure or pain my action is likely to cause for you. And perhaps that is presumptuous. Okay? Not to mention the fact that there could be any number of intervening factors right, that lead to consequences I didn't intend. Okay? So utilitarianism does have its difficulties, but I always urge you to focus on what an ethical tradition positively contributes to this ongoing discussion of the meaning of goodness. One major advance is that morality, for the first time, is not simply a human consideration. We ought to consider the way we treat animals as well. Another major advance, it is concerned with the welfare of everyone, not just the self. And it also makes the observation that perhaps ethical standards originate not in reason, but perhaps in our feelings. Okay? So, if we were to go back to those questions, like, what is the origin of ethics? Well, the origin of ethics for the utilitarians is human nature. Human nature seeks happiness. Everyone seeks pleasure in the absence of pain. And that is where we get our moral bearings. The question of relativism. Again, because all human beings seek pleasure in the absence of pain, this is a universal theory of ethics. However, it can accommodate cultural relativism because the kinds of activities or actions which are likely to cause pleasure in one environment might not cause pleasure in another environment. Okay. The question of human nature we are sentient beings given to happiness, understood as pleasure in the absence of pain. Okay, But we are also reasonable.
and regarding the practical question, what makes something right or wrong? Well, if an action eventuates in a net increase in the total happiness for all those affected by that action, then the action is right. If it eventuates in a decrease in happiness, it is wrong. Okay? Questions? Well, I'll let you chew on that for a while, and of course we can discuss it further because you're not going to have a utilitarianism quiz until after the midterm. That'll be quiz number six. Okay? So your primary job is to look for another announcement that quiz number five is available, okay? And then the announcement that the midterm is available. Get those done and um, consult the calendar for the next reading assignment.